And so this is a little bit of a this is a little bit of experiment today. So welcome everybody who's uh, on Zoom. And this is our this is an experiment today to see if we can do a hybrid event. So we actually have a little bit of a live audience consisting of some members of my uh, advisory board and some of our graduate students and some of the graduate students we and a couple of my fac our faculty members and. We just had been having an informal discussion with our guest today, Mike Gill. So yeah, I'm going to introduce Mike a little bit further. A lot of you will know Mike. Uh, this is the last of our uh, sessions for the semester where we bring in guests to talk about really what's their view about what's going on in, in business uh, today and what's going on in the future. And uh, the way we do this, I explained to Mike earlier on, same format, even though we've got a live audience here, is that Mike and I are going to have a discussion for about 20 minutes. Uh, I've got two or three questions for Mike, and that's going to kind of generate hopefully some material. We're going to break into small groups, and you know, I want you to sort of have some discussions uh, in the small groups, uh, and I'll give you some guidance on that uh, as well. But again, I want you basically <coughs> to come back with some questions for Mike, and then we have a sort of interactive discussion. I'm going to curate that. Uh, and we have an interactive discussion. We try to make this very dynamic, interactive. And, and those of you who know Mike, it's not very hard to be dynamic with Mike, okay? Uh, there, uh, uh, Mike is well known around the state, particularly since he was, uh, now I'm just getting a warning here, uh, here that we are recording this, okay? For, for those of you who are interested, I hope that's okay. Uh, so we're going ahead. Thanks, Danielle. Uh, so Mike is well known around the state, you know, 2015, 2019 was well known around the state as a you know, secretary for a, for, for commerce. Uh, but, but Mike really got a remarkable stance to look at a business today. He, uh, he started off as a graduate from, from well, graduate from Calvert Hall, where he played baseball against uh, actually some some more prominent people around, around here, yeah. here <laughs> president. We won't say who who struck out most, but, uh, <laughs> but this is against President Schmoke. Kurt, and Kurt Schmoke and I go back to when we were 12 and 13. Yeah. He was the old. <laughs> he was a graduate of Towson, which is, you know, is one of our Towson, is one of our, our neighbors. And, uh, and had, you know, I, I, you know, had a, a corporate career. And this is one thing we're going to add. You know, and it, it, you know, it's a, a corporate career where people are, you know, it seems very familiar to a lot of people. IBM, IBM sales, uh, Ernst & Young, or it was Ernst & Whitney at that time, and then, you know, became an entrepreneur. Uh, and then from entrepreneur, you know, there he founded a Americom, which is, uh, was a, that was an 81, it was a founder of cellular product. I was going to ask you how big the phones were. I remember, you know, I used to carry it. I was really good. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that was, you know, tremendously successful, although we were, we were talking informally beforehand, and it, it does describe a scene which Mike Jr. probably was two, three weeks of the corner, right? <laughs> where, here, you know, where, where your mother screamed at him. Uh, and, uh, but it's, uh, he would have been born when he wouldn't have any bad memories. <laughs> right. but, uh, but it did actually end up topping 70 million in revenue, I think it was sold to Selectron, which was an $8 billion publicly traded firm. And, uh, and then, then Mike had a career in, in finance, and uh, he's still uh, a partner and is chair of Evergreen Advisors, which is a Maryland based uh, investment bank. So, uh, so Mike, welcome, and uh, it, it's great to have you here. So, I, I'm going to start with you know, you know, we've got a mixture in our audience of you know our business partners and our students and our and our and our, and our faculty, but and staff. But you know, I think I'm really interested in your career choices. You know, you you know, you know, you're you've got a, a you're an IBM guy, you're an Ernst and Young guy. These are the kind of you know quintessential you know quintessential right uh, American companies. You know, and uh, and then you decide to become an entrepreneur. Why? <laughs> what happened to you? <laughs> well, part, at times I used to think of myself like the punchline of that joke, who pushed me? Um, you know, Murray, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, opportunistic. Um, 
you know, IBM was a, uh, when, you're, when you're just getting out of school and you, you know, nothing. And, and back in those days, back in the 70s, IBM was still a very special place to get an opportunity. Um, you work with great people. It's competitive. You, you'll learn a lot. Um, you learn a lot about different industry sectors. It's the very nature of IBM, um, very industry-oriented company. Uh, had the opportunity to, to teach in sales school for a brief period. Uh, and then I came back to Baltimore to join Ernst & Winnie in a consulting role. Um, Ernst & Winnie was trying to build their practice in, in, in all the consulting areas of data systems. And uh, the truth of the matter is, I was really a lousy consultant. I wasn't very good at that. Uh, but it, was, it, it fit me in the fact that there were about 15 young men and women who were really good. They had good technical skills, data systems, et cetera. And my mission in life was to find enough work to keep them all busy. And uh, but like everything else in my life, and we left off a little bit earlier, I started talking about curiosity. I started talking about opportunities. I started talking about networking. You know, I was only at Ernst and Winnie for two years, but to this day, I probably have 30, 40 great friends who I met there. And because that's the way life is. Philip's the master of it. He can write the book. Uh, I'll come to the book signing. <laughs> um, about networking and relationships. So I think when all of a sudden, and I met someone, this is the way things happen. I had a very good friend that I worked with, Ernst and Winnie. I, I mentioned him earlier. He was the one who had the strong uh, financial background uh, as a CPA and Wharton MBA. And together we formed that company called America. You know, we, we looked at each other one day. We both wanted to do something different. And uh, cellular industry had just kicked off. I worked for a company one year in the cellular industry. And then in 1984 was when, I think it was in the summer of 84 when we actually started Americom. But we had looked at each other and we both said, hey, let's start a business. And I said to myself, with the cellular industry, it's, it's not like trying to figure out how to create a cyber company. To me, that has a little bit more of a challenge to it than figuring out how to create a cellular company. And our vision wasn't that great in the beginning. It was like, go out there and hire a, good, a bunch of good looking young men and women. Um, give them the basics about if they have, don't have a sales background, give them the basics. What we're really looking for is hunger and competitiveness and you go knock on doors. So it was an opportunistic thing. And then I had a friend at Ernst & Winnie when we both sort of looked at each other one day and said, hey, let's do something together. So we wrote the business plan. We each put 30 grand, as I mentioned earlier to you, we didn't have. Got an SBA loan for $230,000 and, uh, and off we went. And, and it wasn't exactly, wasn't exactly like pew, just straight to the clouds and then off to the next one. I mean, it was like, whoa, you know, and I've never been great on rides at the amusement park. So I, <laughs> I had to learn how to handle those dips and those valleys. But guess what? If you can survive them, it's unbelievable how, how much tougher you get, how much more realistic you get, how much more capable you get. So, so it, was, it was opportunistic, the idea of, of having this, of being able to, to start a company and, uh, and uh, fight your way through it. I learned a lot about, by the way, that we used to, people used to say when it comes to dogs that, that hunt, I mean, the very first time a dog goes out in the field, it doesn't matter whether or not the bloodlines of the dog are supposedly really great hunting dogs. You just don't know until that gun goes off for the first time. Is the dog going to put its tail between its legs and look for cover? Or is the dog going to have a clue? It's, it's not a lot different than when you're in an entrepreneurial type of a world, you know, because you're going to get punched really hard, really hard. You know, like someone said, you can't become a champion until you've been on your face and you got to get up to, before the count of 10, get started again. But if you can, it's unbelievable how much stronger you get to be able to then get to get to the next level. So that was an opportunity. It just came about as, as simply as Sonny and I having a conversation and say, hey, why don't we do something together? That was about how complex it was. And then, uh, then we did sell the company. Uh, the partnership didn't last uh, more than two, three years. Um, then we, but the company was sold in 2000 uh, successfully. 
had two had uh, I stayed a couple of years with the organization and 80,000 employees at Selectron at the time, as I mentioned, eight billion dollars in revenue. Um, and then I went off to went off to the next opportunities. You know, full disclosure, uh, and I and it's it's on my resume. I don't I don't uh, I don't stick it in a folder. As I took a crack at trying to turn around a, a company with great promise, but it was too early on. A company called Blue Fire. Blue Fire was started by the Kaminsky brothers, Den Dennis and Mark. They really had great technology. It was really the, the one of the earliest companies to develop really kind of a, uh, uh, a, a shield uh, to place around data uh, on handset devices, on laptops. Uh, we we th thought the, the bigger market was going to be mobile handsets. Uh, the iPhone had not yet been developed. Mm. Rotec was a significant investor. There were a couple other significant investors. They were they were they were going in the wrong direction. Frank Adams, one of my best friends who founded Rotec, asked me if I'd like to go over there and see if I could figure out how to pull it out of the fire. We we thought we had it sold to Symantec, uh so that everybody would have gotten out whole, and then Symantec decided they didn't want to do it. So that was the end of uh, Blue Fire. And, um, and I knew it was probably going to be challenged when early on I got there, I called up Lowell McAdam, who at the time was the CEO of Verizon Wireless. I said, hey, Lowell, let me tell you what I'm doing. Blue Fire, we have the ability to protect data and, and other things on handsets. What do you think? He goes, Mike, I think it's going to be huge. Um, but we don't plan on doing anything at this point, we're not going to go out there and be the lead group to say, oh, by the way, you 10 million, 20 million subscribers, your information could be uh, you know, at risk. <clears throat> the iPhone didn't exist. So that was one of the, but anyway, so, so you got you to gotta be in both places. Um, please, Mark. So they, I mean, I, so you've had two, you know, I think this is, this is an easy move to my, to my next uh, yeah. area the question to, to get some stuff out of there people can discuss you know yeah. your you know because i think your your experience of being an entrepreneur is something i think we do see a point of something uh, research there that you know that the, the idea of the big visionary you know entrepreneur is is somewhat of a mythology it's somewhat of a myth but you had experience both success and and uh, not so successful and then you're you know investing in companies and seeing companies and, in looking at entrepreneurs, I mean, what would you what what do you look for in entrepreneurs? I mean, what what is it that that are you know makes these entrepreneurs tick that you know that are able to you know like you are able to go on the up and downs and and, and succeed you know eventually? I mean, what, what, yeah. what do you see? Oh, you know, right here in this room, Murray, I could I, I could just I could go right across this row and I could identify characteristic about about these individuals that I've, that I've known. Uh, and, and then as I anticipated being here with you today, I, I thought about some, some other folks that I know who have had success as entrepreneurs. And, and in my mind, I was just really looking for some, some common denominators. Um, because by the way, there ain't no formula for who's going to make it and who ain't going to make it. There's no formula. But when I thought about some of these individuals, in terms of characteristics, you know, it, it's somewhere along the way, whether it's that individual or it's somebody else, somebody had it, at least the idea. They had the, they had the, they had that particular initial flame or or, or, or spark of what it is we're going to attempt to do. And by the way, it's a rare day when there's there's nothing linear about the world of an entrepreneur and the world of a startup. I mean, we really thought our vision in 1984 with Americom. My vision wasn't any greater at that moment in time than hiring those good looking young men and women, showing them how to sell, giving them the basic information, and then good luck, get out there and knock on doors. You know, within 10, 12 years, we weren't even in the sales business. We, we serendipitously, a couple other opportunities presented itself, and we went, Oh, isn't that interesting? And in 1987, Bell Atlantic Mobile started opening up. Uh, Bell Atlantic mobile phone centers. You know, this was the first dip into retail. You know, they, the very first one in the whole country was on Aylesbury Road, 
where gramophone is in Timonium. Mm -hmm. And the president of Bell Atlantic Mobile called me up. His name was Tim Connolly. He said, hey, Mike, we're going to open up these mobile phone centers. And since, and since you guys are experts in service, we had two service technicians working out of a Domino's, old Domino's pizza location. He goes, we don't have an interest to do the service at these various mobile phone centers. So we want you to staff all the mobile phone centers on the service side of things. Um, we'll own the buildings, we'll have a contract, and I think it'll be a good business for you. And 10, 12 years later, there were about a thousand people working in that kind of a role. It was serendipitous. That's why I said to you earlier, the curiosity is often what can be the, the difference maker. But the characteristics of those individuals, there's a whole bunch of them. You know, I wrote some of them down just thinking about it. I do believe you got to be passionate. I, I know a lot of entrepreneurs are nerdy and they're, 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 they're at least, at least there's the, there's the um, uh, picture of that, of that entrepreneur. But for me, passion and enthusiasm, enthusiasm doesn't have to mean jump, you know, like um, uh, Ballmer at, uh, when he was at Microsoft. I mean, he legitimately is crazy. He is legitimately wacko. But it worked in a place that was loaded with those non-passionate, enthusiastic people, at least from a physical standpoint. But I do believe passion and enthusiasm, you, you, you got to find it somewhere. You know, energy is obvious. You know, you've got to, you, because you're going to, you're going to influence others. That's one of the reasons why I think these characteristics matter, because you will influence other individuals and, and get them engaged in what you're trying to do. You know, attitude is a given. I mean, are you kidding me? As I said earlier, you know, when we created this culture of yes concept in, in commerce, in a state that had consistently demonstrated at the government level that they didn't give a poop about business. <laughs> or worse than that. Or worse than that. Yeah. You know, when we created the culture of yes, and I and it spread throughout the other agencies in the state of Maryland, um, I, everyone began to realize that by having a positive attitude about problems, challenges you're dealing with, it's amazing how much how, what how many times you can solve the problem by saying there's got to be an answer here. So attitude was a big deal, and uh, to the entrepreneur, because are you kidding me? I had a. Uh, I had so many opportunities if I if I had just sort of gotten a little weak knee when I had the partnership didn't work out the numbers weren't being counted correctly went to see a good buddy of mine who had a real nice accounting firm because um, the partnership was done and I had to figure out how to keep the puppy the baby alive I went to the uh, my buddy and and I handed him the financials this was probably late '86 somewhere in there I handed him the financials I said Dick what do you think he goes it took him, took him at least 30 seconds to answer my question. He goes, I think you're bankrupt. <laughs> I said, no, no, what do you really think? <laughs> I still think you're bankrupt. And he said, if I were you, I'd follow chapter seven because this doesn't look pretty. And save your butt, save your house, since that's what you basically collateralized everything with. I said, Dick's not an option. Left his office and probably, probably was what I should have done. But if, if, if you just believe... I can figure this out. Sometimes you can't. I got lucky because I figured it out because it was within six to nine months when I got that phone call that said, we want you to be the service organization. So from a standpoint of attitude, I, I think, I think charisma, I read that somewhere in an article the other day. I, th I think, I think, I think, yeah, whatever it is, it doesn't mean you have to be a talk show host, but, but be yourself, by the way, being yourself is a great start when it comes to being charismatic. Just be yourself. I swear to God, every single one of you, that's going to be good enough to get that ball rolling. Just be yourself and be it authentically. Don't be it superficially, be it authentically. Um, you know, and I've always heard all my, my, my buddy, Frank Adams, he's always said one of the things he loves of, of his of companies they invest in is he does, he does like the founders and the leaders of the firm to have a lean mentality. <laughs> he said, I can't tell you, Mike, how often they, they get a, they raise three, four, five million dollars. They, they, they might have had a lean mentality because they had no choice. And then all of a sudden they have a not lean mentality. Mm -hmm. So it's not a bad thing. That, that, those are things that jump out. You should put them in sort of 
it should be deans before they go into that <laughs> the mentality. So, there is. so here's my last question before we break, but it's uh and it's you know it really is tapping into your department of commerce days. And we had you know in our informal discussion earlier on, we were talking about you know Maryland and your success during your period of our success, right, Davida? Thanks, you. Team effort. Yes. Remember, so, and increasing jobs. But, you know, in terms of, you know, entrepreneurship and venture capital and these types of enterprises compared to other states, how do you think Maryland's doing? <laughs> well, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, every now and again, I'm honest. <laughs> Once in a while. Um, we could be doing a hell of a lot better. I mean, we tried really hard. I, I tried, we as a team at Commerce, we tried really hard to, to, to put that religion of economic development and how proactive economic development initiatives and programs to support businesses in Maryland and have them genuinely feel that government gives a hoot, that if we could have imparted that to everyone as a religion, then Maryland, Montgomery County was a good example. I used to say, I used to have to always be careful because <laughs> you know, when you open your mouth, you're, you're representing the governor. So I had to be careful every now and again when I was with some groups. But I used to say about Montgomery County <laughs> that if they ever discovered economic development, they could be the 51st state in the country. They got all the they got all the natural resources you could ever want. They got smart people. They got the federal government agencies. They got really good public schools. So you're gonna have a you're gonna have a good workforce that's going up to the next level. They're next door to where all the money is, called Washington D.C. They're located next to Frederick that has a lot of good things going on. Frederick has been on a roll. My biggest concern there is that is they catch the Montgomery County disease mm -hmm. and that they somehow or another, they lose their entrepreneurialism mm -hmm. in Montgomery and Frederick. So, so from that standpoint, state of Maryland, um, we are not close to where we could be. We have, uh, we have elected officials by and large in Annapolis that who don't under, whatever they do understand about economic development is, is heresy in relationship <laughs> to what it, what it really is. <laughs> Um, they, they just mostly see us as, as resources for, <clears throat> for tax revenues. Um, they don't understand the connection between those states, because by the way, I, I, I went through one period, Murray, where I, I used the word empirical a whole lot. It became like my favorite word. And it's partially because a guy named Scott Dorsey, Mary Properties, gave me a terrific book called The Wealth of States. Arthur Lapper and Stephen Moore and some of those really, uh, really smart economists. And what it did is it showed the relationship between those states who have the most proactive economic development programs, who have the best tax structure for the corporations in that state, and its association to growth in the state's GDP, growth in the state's adjusted gross income, growth in the state's population, and it was almost exact. And it was at the opposite end of the spectrum. If you're New Jersey, Connecticut, New York, um, Maryland, <clears throat> you know, flat growth, flat growth at best, flat growth on population, flat growth on income growth, flat growth on GDP, it's just flat. So that so in that regard, Murray, um, I hope it's like I hope it, I hope for it in Baltimore. I hope for it at the state level. Uh, Governor Hogan's done the best he can in an environment where the the deck is stacked. Um, I hope like the heck if, if if somehow some way we get that inspired leader and people who can buy into economic development being a good thing and not a bad thing, then we can be wherever we want to be. Until then, we're going to be a state of riches that's getting a lousy return on investment. Because we do have riches, a vast, lot of them. vast riches. Yeah. I mean, the whole so state is in that sense. Like Montgomery County. 
you know, whole sex. Yeah. So this is a good this is a good time for I think we'll yeah now we're going to sorry let, 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 a lot of the groups have some little discussion and then you know and what we've been discussing you know what you know we're going to break into small groups same is going to do this you know do this you know if you're on Zoom this will be done randomly and I, you know those of you who have been before you know that you know students go with faculty there's no you can grade the faculty the students but there's no there's no grades in this everybody's equal. Uh, there and, and what I like each of the groups to come back is some questions. Mike, either about for, for Mike, either about entrepreneurship itself and where it's going, or about entrepreneurship in Maryland and where it's going and, and how economic development is going, and uh, or any other questions you have about how, where business is going, you know, in in the uh, in, in the future. So so we'll be back in in, in about fifteen minutes. Okay in exactly 15 minutes in fact okay uh, so keep it that and so in this group here what occurs let's break into sort of small kind of groups so to, hold off my question sort of. yeah 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 let's let's say let's make into some small groups and get back with questions maybe you know about, about 15 minutes I, I would suggest that we break into into sort of you know four basic Groups, you know, maybe you know, Philip, you can go with the beta gamma sigma uh, <laughs> students, and then you, you, Sonny, you go with these two guys, you know, and uh, you know, and maybe Mike, you can go with Henry and uh, South Africa. It is November, almost 2022. If you were to start a business now, what kind of business would you start? Oh boy. No, <laughs> Great question. Jay. So the, I hope everybody got that bet. Everybody got that question. Let me just do it again, Jay. I'm okay. I'm not if you were, you. if you were going to start a business now, 2021, what business would it be? Broken stick repair shop, spatula warehouse. I don't know. I might be. I might uh, equally be looking hard at buying a business. What kind the, of? I think it would probably be a service business. I think it would be a service business where we have the, where it is a service. A service is being provided where the market is um, strong enough. I don't know if it's transportation. I don't know if it's an aspect of healthcare. Uh, it seems like the whole world it wants to be in home healthcare. Um, everybody does, but it's, but it's something where the marketplace is large and the demand continues to be great, I'm probably okay if it's a crowded space because that space is gonna get thinner. And then I'm gonna try to win the battle on superior customer service and differentiating my product from, from everybody else. Because I really found that over my, over my time, everybody, just about everybody, especially in the service sectors, if you said to them, What's your competitive advantage? Nine out of 10 are gonna say, oh, customer service. Mm -hmm. And then if you look under the covers, you say, what else don't they tell the truth about? <laughs> and so I really believe that it, 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 may, it could well be a, a buying, buying an enterprise um, and then differentiating it dramatically on customer service and, and maybe other ancillary things. So that's probably, so in terms of at least at the at the funnel level, at the top of the funnel, and trying to figure out, well, what might it be? I might at least start from a standpoint of, of an industry sector that has size, uh, uh, service-based uh, industry sectors that are uh, that are large and growing, a lot of players as opposed to a few players. If I get lucky and I happen to go, holy cow. That's a that's a four hundred million dollar business right here in Baltimore. There's only three players. Huh. Well, then we'll take a look at that. But that's such a quick answer, Jay. And I, you know, we know we know the, uh, the the industry sectors. They seem to get a lot of. We know the healthcare. We know the cyber. We know the uh, technology. You know, they get a lot of recognition. Um, that, that's right. a quick thought. So we got some. Some yeah. great questions here, you know, coming up, you know, as well, and I'll encourage more from that. That that was that was a great, a great question. I'm going, to, I'm going to divide these into sort of at the moment. I'm seeing, you know, two types of questions. There's questions about, 
what students need, and what, what, what business people in fact need. There's one question. There's some questions I, I, I see also about graduate department of commerce uh, days, and and I think I've also got a colleague from the department of commerce here, so she might be able to answer one of them for you. So, yeah. So, uh, but it's a uh, but a. Uh, on on the on on some of the skills that students need and, and business people should be thinking about uh, a question is, is from one of our faculty Frank Frank Van Lee to think noticing that you had quite a lot of business experience including you know, IBM sales training before you went into entrepreneurship would you advise students to get firsthand experience working for someone else working someplace else before the attempt to be an entrepreneur. You know, I heard a uh, many, many years ago, I heard an interesting uh, comment. Um, they asked, it was an individual who had a very, very successful corporate career. Uh, one of the top three or four executives of one of the 50 largest companies in this country. And they asked him that question. They said, look, if you had it to do all over again, uh, what would you have done differently? He said, well, I have a really wonderful home out in like, let's call it like Sun Valley, Idaho or somewhere, something like that, a really neat place. He goes, and I happen to, I know a lot of my neighbors and what's interesting is they're all entrepreneurs. I mean, they, 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 I'm the only corporate executive out there. And he said, so what would I maybe do differently? He said, I came out of school with an accounting degree. He said, I think what I would have done is I would have, uh, I would have, I would have gotten a job and maybe I had a series of them with the best companies that would hire me. And I would bust my fanny to learn all that I could. That's whether it's five years, seven years, maybe 10 years, learn all that I can. I'm gonna work, I'm gonna outwork everybody. That's the other interesting thing I heard one time. They said, you know, when I got out of school, I didn't have any experience. So I realized that the only way you really get experience is by putting in the time. So you know what I did? I work twice as hard and long as everybody else. So in a matter of, of, of two years, I got four years of experience. So I thought it was an interesting answer. Coming out of school, get your MBA. Uh, that's a wonderful thing to have, uh, an area that you concentrate in, whether it's finance or marketing or, or some other aspect of the MBA program. Go get a job with the best company you can, company that really is known for challenging uh, their people moving them forward, not sticking them at a desk and, and dying there. Go get a job with one of those kind of enterprises. And then, and, and then you buy a little bit of time while you're, while you're picking up a paycheck, you're getting experience, you're meeting a lot of people. I mean, me showing up at Ursa Winnie. I mean, in retrospect, it, 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 uh, at, a, at a macro level, it was, why did I ever go to Ursa Winnie? But guess what? I serendipitously, you know, met an individual we had that conversation as i said earlier robert frost and the road less travel is my favorite poem because i took the road less travel and it made all the difference so that's, that's what i probably do go get a great job work for somebody this idea of you know i'm going to be an entrepreneur you know day two after i graduate um well good for you if if, if that opportunity is out there but in the meantime get a job with a with a company where you can bust your fanny and the company will recognize it and reward you for it. And you'll have all your options available to you. So now there's, a, I'm gonna move on, you know, I've got sort of two areas. And one, one, one moving on to back to your Department of Commerce days, or really the Commerce Department of today. Long, long time yeah. ago. I can still there, there really are two, two questions about you know what this, but it basically comes down to this. You know, you know what, what can the state do to encourage you know more businesses to move here? I mean, that's 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 the that that's the that's the core of a couple of questions that are in the, in the chat. You know, it's something that comes to mind right away, Murray, which points out the challenge of 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 that question and coming up with with good answers that are that are. Um, executable it'd be like a it'd be like a, a four-star five and i love college football it'd be like a four-star five-star kid um from uh oh i don't know anywhere other than maryland 
and they come to visit the University of Maryland College Park. I'm not picking on them because they're you know because they're not a very good football team, but it'd be like coming to the University of Maryland College as a recruit because they want you to come. They want you to come to Maryland, just like the, the business. They want you to come to Maryland, and you know the coaches are pumping them up, and and then the kids there with a few of the current players, and they and they're leaning in going. You don't want to come here. We don't have great leadership. We don't have a vision for success. We don't have the resources and facilities to be able to compete. Um, we don't have a culture that's really a differentiator. It, it, we're also where else being recruited? Uh, Clemson. Go to Clemson. <laughs> so I, I, I think it's not. It's a little bit of a of a stretch, but I don't think it's much different that, because what I find in the business world is that um, the world that McCormick lives in, um, everybody knows everybody. The automotive industry, even though it's that big, everybody knows everybody. So I just read where Toyota is going to put a battery uh, factory down in uh, south of Greensboro, North Carolina. It's going to be the first uh, investment uh, of an automotive guy. By the way, I just had an objection from the chat in the chat from a Turk. Well, <laughs> they're going to the bowl. They're going to a bowl, Mike. <laughs> well, congratulations, <laughs> and I I won't take back any of it. Um, the uh, but but I, I believe that that's part of the challenge, and that is for the businesses to feel if they were all surveyed, asking those big open questions about satisfaction. Um, Net promoter score. Remember net promoter score. If I had to do all over again, would I have my business in Maryland or would I have it somewhere else? Net promoter score says you can only have a yes or no answer. It doesn't say you can have qualified answers. It's yes or no. When Governor Hogan ran, ran for office, he was making a big deal about the fact that there was some survey that was out there that said something like uh, over 50% of the people that live in our state said that they would live somewhere else if they could. They'd move to another state. Governor Hogan, he laid on that one big when he was running for governor. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, it, but that's the opportunity too. All of that is the problem, it's the opportunity. I don't have that answer. I think the business community, we do all have to get on the same page. We're, right now we're, we're, we're reading out of about a hundred different hymnals. And it makes it really difficult to get any leverage on the issues. It makes it difficult to get leverage on some member of the House of Delegates from, from District 37A, where all you had to do was get 7,000 votes and, and you're now a delegate. Can I ask a question? Please. Quick question. Yeah. And then, so, then so we're move. Yeah. Mike, um, how much of the challenge in Maryland is caused because Baltimore <clears throat> is just a separate universe to the rest of the state? Separate from an image standpoint, separate, separate from, from marketing, image, you name it. I mean, it's just businesses are done, you know, businesses here. And, you know. Well, I, I, I don't think it has to be. I no, it doesn't have to be. I, 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 think, yeah, but I think it is. That's the point I'm making. I, I, think what, I, I think what happens is, again, I, I, I take a shot at analogies. Sometimes I get them right. Uh, it reminded me of a golf course, an old golf course that for 50 years, uh, it was, the greens were originally rectangular when it was first built in the twenties. After 60, 70 years of cutting greens, you have a tendency to cut them in a circle. So eventually you, you lose the edges. I think in the case of Baltimore, you get more and more isolated. Leadership creates that because leadership looks inward and it doesn't look outward. Man. And then unfortunately, um, as we talked about at T. Rowe Price, they go to Harbor East because they're not going to leave. They're not going to leave Maryland, but they are going to bail on the Central Business District right. because it's very difficult for them to see any indication that leadership in City Hall cares about the Central Business District. So unfortunately, people get insular. They just get insular. So as opposed to reaching out. They have a tendency to kind of do this, and it's like nobody cares. 
And unfortunately, uh, we're so short on, on vision in elected officials. Uh, majority of them have little courage. I mean, little courage. They just, uh, and, and part of the reason they get away with it is because <clears throat> of us, because we don't call them on it. That's why you can get away with it. I'll say that, I don't have anything political, so. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, ahead, please. So this, this is the second last question because the last question is going to be really short. The second last question, and, and it comes from, you know, it comes from Brandon Scott. Not Go ahead. <laughs> I'm ready. No, but I, I haven't had any hate mail from Brandon Scott yet. <laughs> but it's a, uh, it, it, it is similar to one that we ask a, quite a few of our guests, but this one is very specific. I'm going to turn this towards business schools particularly. The, the, the question was about what academic institution should be doing, but I'm going to make it for a business school because we want this advice. Your view about what business schools should really be focusing on that their workforce needs. Employers need that's going to develop this Maryland workforce. You know, that, that's, now it, by the way, this came from one of our guests, you know, so, so, so it didn't come from faculty. This time, I think. So, uh, this is, you know, what, 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 do, what should academic institutions, what should, what would what be what we most important for us to teach, maybe, maybe as a way of putting it, or that would have the biggest impact on, on workforce, or attracting workforce here, you know, attracting businesses here. I, you know, no, no order of priority. I mean, the one thing that, one thing that quickly comes to mind, and uh, I always think we can do better, we can do so much better whether it's at an undergraduate level, graduate level, um, on all the soft stuff. We, we might think of it as soft stuff, but it's not soft stuff. Our communication skills, our writing skills. Let's, I won't, you know, not, not selling skills, but, but um, relationship skills. You know, that's all, that all matters. I, I, re I remember years ago, I was part of UMBC's graduation, and I was up on the stage as a regent, and UMBC had, you know, many brilliant students. I mean, they, they turned out brilliant students, and I was, a, I was with Freeman standing on the stage, and a lot of the kids were walking, were walking by, uh, getting their degrees, and, uh, and it was kind of like, it was kind of like this, and I, I said, now, Freeman, unless that young man or that young woman is only going to work in a laboratory by herself with equipment for the next 50 years of her life, which they're not. I really believe that we need to do more things to bring out those skills, those community people skills. <laughs> There's, it's, you could argue it's the soft stuff, but I don't think it is. I think it's the vital stuff. I'm, I'm, I, and by the way, when you combine that with your knowledge in very specific areas where those skills are necessary, be it accounting or finance, the brilliant stuff you've done, Samuel, with your degrees from, uh, from one of the great universities in Nigeria, the greatest, the best university in your country. Um, you combine the two, now you're talking. People skills, communication skills, developing that comfort level to be around people. So, so I think that's the one thing that is, as dean of the school, uh, of this fine school, that like the law school um, has turned out more people to have impact on the business community and the court system. UB Law has always been proud of the fact that whether it's district, circuit, or even the uh, Court of Appeals, that UB has been competitive for 75 years in having uh, lawyers become members of the bar at all these high levels, uh, the judicial system at all these high levels. I think we can do the same thing from a business standpoint. And I think it's one thing you can only you can only get the students to to such and such a level in terms of their financial skills. I mean, there's some ceiling on that. There just is. But I'll tell you what. Go ahead. They got a smart person at Harvard who's getting their MBA and their finance focused. And they're real smart, and they probably had perfect SATs, and they have never had anything less than a 99 uh, average. But if they don't have those soft skills, I don't care. So guess where you can level the playing field at UB is by having superior skills in all those living skills, communication skills, and being very solid with your academic uh, uh, focus. 
So, so Murray, that's probably the one. I, I'd probably make it almost like you can't get, you can't graduate. You don't get your certificate until we have somehow or another demonstrated that we have helped you to, to optimize your potential as a communicator, as an effective leader. Harvard doesn't turn out leaders necessarily. They turn out people that are really smart and are really in a, in a particular lane. They're really good. You know, even T. Rowe Price would tell you that uh, they hire investors. They don't hire, for example, the individual who is going to be the, as I mentioned earlier, who will be the CEO and chairman shortly, Rob Sharps. Uh, a couple of my buddies were on the board and they said that uh, with starting a couple of years ago when he was on the very, very short list to be the successor, the, the one thing he had did not have a lot in his background, he had no leadership responsibilities. He was a very smart investor. I mean, really good. So they gave him some assignments and he aced them. But isn't that interesting? Up until a couple of years ago, he just had not, you know, he hadn't run an organization with let's say a thousand people or 5,000 people or, or 500 people. So work on the soft stuff. That's good, good advice. I used to, I used to tell people that Though I was proud to have a degree from Harvard, I was always amused by at Harvard Business School. The previous dean's uh, mission statement was leaders who made a difference. But it didn't say what kind of, what was a good thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> it wasn't a difference at all. It was just leaders who made a difference. So, uh, so that was a, so here's a last, here's the last question. We're a little bit over. Thanks very much for waiting. But I think there's a great, great content here. And that was, that was great. Uh, we, we're, we're at, got an active debate on this. This is the last question, and this can be very short because it's, it requires a, a very short answer. But one of my colleagues points out that in the old days in IBM, and this goes back quite a few days, you know, to uh, to Watson, uh, that uh, on every executive desk was a plaque, and it said "Think." <laughs> so, uh, so if you were, if you had to design a desk sign for you know, for the today's executive or business leader, what would it be? You know, that's fine. You know, Murray, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because um, uh, this was also folklore inside IBM back in the uh, 60s. Tom Watson Sr. did succeed his father as the, as the head of, IB, of the IBM Corporation. And he was a very impatient man, Tom Watson Sr. He had a short fuse. Uh, he let everybody know if he wasn't pleased. And IBM went through a period, it might have been somewhere in the 60s. Um, it went through a period where they were they were stinking up the gym. I mean, from in, in relationship to what people expected from IBM. So they said that Tom Watson Jr., when he would go through an IBM uh, office, and it could, it, whether it was an office or it was a plant or it was a distribution hub, because that sign, think, appeared everywhere. He pulled a he had a black magic marker in his pocket and everywhere because he, he was again short fused and they were stinking up the gym everywhere he saw think he took the black march marker and he crossed through it and he wrote do <laughs> that's all he wrote was do so i don't know if i got if i have a, 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 a one sign that but it, it fits the question you asked because we spend a lot the mission is to, to get the job done. Don't think about it indefinitely. And by the way, I also believe that having a sense of urgency and making the decision yep. that uh, unless, unless you demonstrate during your whole life that you can't, you have lousy judgment, you know, most 80% of the time, your, your, your instinct on how to address a problem is, is going to be probably okay. But not if you're going to wait indefinitely to try to make sure that you're making the right decision. You know, it's the old don't manage lead, that type of thing. And Jack Welsh used to say that uh, when he talked about control your own destiny or someone else will, all he really was trying to say is, is make a decision. Make a decision and move on. Move on. I think that IBM chat you're talking about got uh, influenced Yoda because Yoda said, do or do not. There is no try. So it's not about thinking. It's about thinking. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. yeah. Yoda. Yoda again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there we go, Allison. <laughs> Show Ray. Yoda. So we'll, Mike. 
Thank you very much. This is a thanks for this has been a really really good lot of wisdom. So both in electronic capital, we'll do a real stuff. Thank you. And we really need that wisdom. And I think it's really good to end the semester with with you know being inspired as well, because you know just as I appreciate you spent time with us earlier as well. It was very inspiring. So uh, so so thank you. I got and a, we'll, I got a book. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question, Murray. I know we're done, but more important. Can I ask? Uh, yeah. Can I make no more questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One more question. Oh, okay. One, one more, more question. <laughs> but I go for that. Um, I know who, that you like the little. Who was my favorite book, person? Now, why, tell, tell us. Ask. Just tell us. Tell the group quickly why you love this book so much. No, I, I, I earlier be, before we all we all got together. I just I, for just so that people could see it, it's related to the last question. We should put it up. Show it. A little engine it could. Yeah. And, 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 by, and by the way, I, I will take two minutes and I'll go fast to give you the how how I made the little engine it could part of me. So it's 1997, uh, spring graduation at Towson University, and I was honored with an honorary doctorate. It was super cool so it was about a month before graduation and i was going to be the commencement speaker and i started thinking all right great well, what are you going to talk about i'm watching i'm watching the more i'm watching good morning america or today show or something and they had a they had a, a an african-american female author on as their guest and she was talking about how it wasn't that many years prior to that time where she was a single parent with two young children food stamps, no clue as to how she was going to get to the next day, the next month, grow these two children in a good way. And she said every night, she's telling this story on TV. She said every night when the, when I would put my two children down, I would read the book, Little Engine It Could To Them. You know, and like most parents, I would, I would read it quickly. I would hope the eyes would start to fade out. And for the very first time, when I read it, the words came back to me. They were always coming, they were always going the other way to the children. Now they're bouncing back at me saying, I think I can, I think I can. And she said, and so I, I just, I decided right then and there that I, I had the ability to control my destiny. Uh, I went to college some, I wrote short stories and I was always given uh, nice uh, kudos by people who read my short stories. So I decided I was going to put all of my waking hours into writing because I thought that might be the one thing I could do to turn my life around. And that female author who died uh, within the last couple of years was Toni Morrison, who at that time, I think only Tom Clancy um, was was writing, was writing was selling more books than Toni Morrison. So it, it made sense to me, the little engine that could. And I made it my theme when I gave the commencement speech at Towson. And uh, and it's so it's always hung around, and I've given out a copy of the book, probably a couple hundred copies. This okay. one's for you to keep. And thank you. It ain't going anywhere. Sign so, maybe, sign so, so maybe you have to sign it. Yeah, so we'll maybe maybe it. we should uh, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll do the last thing. Maybe we should uh, maybe we'll make this the textbook, the required textbook uh, for <laughs> the very should. Oh, that's right. good. Oh, I, right. That would be uh, people will talk about that. Uh, that, that. I like that. <laughs> That'll idea. differentiate. Because he has for our next orientation. This is a this will this will you know replace these sporting guys who we're using. Yeah, so uh, so that, that's good. So this is great. I I, I wish everybody really a, a, a very happy holiday. Look forward to seeing you. We're going to start this series again in February. I'm, I'm not sure. Early on, our one of our earliest speakers, which goes on from this, is going to be Troy Stovall, who had to we had to reschedule. But I think it's very appropriate. You know, CEO of Tedco, the which is actually the the largest. It's actually the has the most number of investments in venture in the early stage ventures in Maryland and it's the states. And a good friend, of, I'm sure you know I know him very well, Mike. And and he's he's got a sort of vision about where Maryland can go for for venture capital. So I think that'll be a, an interesting session. And we're going to have some quite interesting speakers, uh, including Joe Sullivan, who is the former chair of a CEO of Mike Mason. That's got a new venture, and he's going to spend quite a bit of time with us. So, so we're, we're going to have some interesting semester. So, uh, but in, in between that time, you know, we've got exams for some people, marking for other people. 
Apologies for everybody, and then we'll be back. So thank you. Okay. Congratulations. 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 Congratulations.